Welcome to the Localization Fireside Chat. I'm Robin Ayoub, your host. Join me for captivating conversations with industry leaders exploring localization, translation, and global communication. Ignite your curiosity as we expand your horizons through these conversations. So let's dive in together into the Localization Fireside Chat. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another Localization Fireside Chat episode. And I am Robin Ayoub, the founder of this independent podcast, independent YouTube channel. We're a young channel. We just gotten started in May 2023. And thank you to all our viewers and, and listeners. You helped us get to 100,000 views on YouTube. Really appreciate that. And to be honest, it may sound so little to somebody who's listening to this channel from other industries, but for the localization subject, it is a major achievement. This is like Mr. Beast for the localization industry, to be honest with you, if I can make those comparisons in terms of number of views. But thank you for everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. And thank you for the good comments that you guys send me back in terms of how you feel about these conversations, that they are conversations, down-to-earth conversations, talking to real people, exploring real subject, real matters from today's realities. So thanks again for joining me. And today I have the honor and the pleasure to be joining, joined by Dolores Rojo Kunatsu. Did I get it right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm practicing my Spanish, Dolores, so I apologize. Thank you so much for joining me. Dolores is, is located in Argentina, my favorite country that I still yet to visit. Mm -hmm. And also today's perspective is a little different. We always talk about on the channel about the latest in technology, the latest in the management practices, the latest in everything that we can talk about, but we rarely talk about the translator's perspective. And I'm very interested today in today's topic, which I think it's going to be exciting to many to find out what do translators do. And for, for people who are from outside the industry, maybe it's always appreciative to hear what do translators do? What, what is your daily job like? What do you think of the new technologies that they're coming in? So these are the topics. First, we'll get to know a little bit about Dolores, He's who she is as a person, as a, as a person of, who's been working in the industry for many years. And Dolores got a lot of expertise in our industry. I won't recite them all. I don't want to take her thunder. And mm -hmm. very expert on, what, on many areas. And Dolores, so as we say on this channel, welcome to the channel at first. The okay. first thing I want to ask you is, if you don't mind... We say everybody's got a story on this channel. So what's your story? How did you all start in the localization industry? What drove you to it? If you don't mind, tell us your personal side. Thank you, Robin. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be part of this amazing channel that I weekly listen and wait for. So thanks a lot for, for this. I'm honored to say the least. And well, my story is like many translators, I think. I began many years ago when internet did not exist, <laughs> even exist. So imagine uh, I am from a very small uh, town in Argentina, uh, located in the north part of the country uh, called Chaco, near Paraguay and Uruguay and Brazil as well, like the frontier. And I came to Buenos Aires when I was 18 years old to study the career of to be a translator, in fact, interpreter, because I wanted to be an interpreter. And at that time, the only there were only two universities offering that in Argentina. And so I came here, it was Cordoba, another city, very big city here, and Buenos Aires. And because, I don't know, my family knew many people in Buenos Aires and it was very far away and you are the, going alone and all that, that when you are beginning, sometimes your parents are afraid of that you are going to the jungle and it was like another city. I came here to a boarding house. I stayed um, there for a year. Then I rented some apartments with different friends and I began my studies and I loved them from the very beginning but found that interpreting was like too, uh, not, I don't know, I was very panicked, you know, when I had to speak like now. <laughs> so excuse my accent and all that because I, my work okay. is mainly writing. You have no accent. Speaking, <laughs> so I'm not very good at this. And well, I began, I finished my studies and I was supposed to go back home, as I said, 
I graduate and go back. And well, I never returned. I stayed here working at that time for international companies uh, located in Buenos Aires. And for 10 years, I worked in-house like Coca-Cola, Pfizer, big companies working as a translator and uh, perhaps proofreader because most of the managers or people I work for knew the, the language very well, but I had to polish that. And then when I got married and I have children, I said, why don't I, I, you work, I've worked fully as a freelance translator. That's why I studied this. So there, after 10 years in house, I began being a freelancer. That was 18 years ago, so imagine. And well, I found my very small company, Lift Value Translations, where I offer different kinds of services to global translation agencies all over the world, mainly in marketing, corporate communications, and um, writing. In a nutshell, I think that's it. I continue working with all the transformation that, you know, our industry has suffered all over the way, but always uh, positive that I think everything is to move us forward and to be more in the business. <laughs> say. That's right. That's right. Now, you mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm always interested, like, so when you go to university and study to be translator, for those who don't know and listening to us today on this episode, in order for you to become a translator, it is not just sufficient to be able to speak the language or know the language or second language. In this case, mm -hmm. you have to be able to say, have the right education, the right expertise, the right experience to become a translator. <clears throat> and it all starts with getting a linguistic degree from a recognizable university and graduate in that, in that bachelor degree or master's. Some people continue to do in their master's. So I've, I've met many people, they do their PhD in linguistics as well. So. In your case, so which university do you study in and how did you find the education process? If you can, you know, if you can tell us a little bit about that, it would be great. Yes, of course. Well, uh, I didn't go to a bilingual school during my elementary and high school uh, education. So when I came here, as you said, my other, you know, my colleagues or companions were perhaps from very good schools in Buenos Aires which offered a, a bilingual education. So I had to sit for an exam to enter the university. I went to the USAL, Universidad de Salvador, which was at that time the, the first one uh, that offered a interpretation, a translation. I'm a legal translator, like I have a, a, a seal and a signature, and you also have the technical and scientific translation a specialty, let's say. And well, to I was very afraid because I think perhaps I don't, you know, I, I, I'm not good. I, I don't approve the introductory course. So I sit also uh, in other, other um, uh, institute. But fortunately, I was able to, to begin at this university that I wanted to. And it was a four, it was a four years study course. Um, it was fully dedicated, you know, you have to study a lot, practice a lot. And of course, you have to master the language, both the languages. I mean, your mother tongue and the second language. In my case, English, perhaps you also can do it in French, Italian, German. And then uh, you have to practice and then go out to the world. <laughs> And I also have a master's degree from the same university, but in marketing, not in translation. Oh, you have it in marketing? Yes. You have another degree in marketing? Marketing. Oh, very, you bring a very good, important topic because, you know, having a degree in translation or in linguistic, you're absolutely correct. Sometimes it's not enough because some of the subject or some of the customers that you're going to be working with or some of the employers that are going to be hiring you. They probably require a little bit more deeper expertise in that topic, whatever that topic is, marketing, health sciences, mechanical, et cetera. It helps tremendously if you have that knowledge expertise where you're going to be translating. Because even if we don't become a translator one day and you're only speaking unilingual, some of the topics are very difficult to understand, even for those who are not in the language business. So if, let's say, you know, you've studied all your life in English and you only read literatures 
and somebody handed you over a user manual for a complex machinery. You're going to look at it and say, well, that sounds Chinese to me, even though I speak English. I don't understand what it's saying. Sure. That's right, because some of those manuals are meant to be read by engineers, for instance. And if the engineer can relate to the language, of course, they understand what it say. But if for the normal person, they cannot. And the same goes for translators, where there are translators, correct me if I'm wrong, there are translators that can translate into general topics. But those translators, that they're required to do in-depth translation on in-depth topics. Marketing is one of them because you gotta have to have a creative flair, creative way of writing. The health sciences, pharmaceutical, medical, etc., engineering, mechanical, any other subject, you require a little bit more in-depth knowledge. Is that is that correct? Sure. In fact, I I cannot translate a technical manual if you ask me to because it's. I do like many employee manuals, for example, like corporate manuals, corporate uh, communications, but not the technical one because I am not expert on that. And there's a lot of time that we have to invest in terminology management, terminology databases. Of course, Mm -hmm. now everything is perhaps easier or not that complex that it used to be thanks to technology, translation memories, AI and all that. But even, even, even though that you have to know if it's correct. So you have to know the field that you are translating to. In my case, I only, you can do general translation, but not very specific. If it's too technical, like for example, as you said, a machine, it's really Chinese to me. I cannot do it. So I refer to a friend who is an expert on that, but I concentrate on the fields that I am, that I master. And yeah. That I can understand. Of course. Now, let me, let's talk a little bit about, since you've been doing translation for a while, and I've been in the industry for a while as well, and we've both seen various stages of our industry either evolve, in some cases, depends on the opinion, right? Some people mm-hmm. say, well, we're evolving, and some other people say, no, 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 we're going backward. And there are some people who say, no, oh, no, we're still in the middle. So in yeah. your in your case, <laughs> in mm-hmm. your case, so tell me, from actually doing the translation work, so... Tell me about how do you do that? Is it done regularly, like type it in a Word document? Is there another way of doing it using memory-based translation serv- uh, solutions or any other way? And how did that evolve Like from when you started to what you're doing right now? So we'll talk a little bit about what you're currently using in terms of a process. But how did that all start for you? Is it like an old traditional way of doing any yeah. writing? When I began, like the beginning, it was so different because I began writing, you know, and you have to go to the, um, to the library to no look way. up everything in the dictionaries. Yes, oh, when you, we, we, tell, we tell the young graduate right now, go to the library, do look up some references. Uh, I don't know how that would go. But, yeah. <laughs> My eldest son, who is studying in Germany, goes to the library, but with his iPad or his computer and just to study, not to open the books that are in the library. <laughs> I went to the library to open the dictionaries and to research and find out information related to the subject I had to translate. But nowadays, we know everything is in internet and everything is digital. That it was a huge change for uh, us translators who have like more than 25 years of experience, let's say. So I began that way. And then the typewriter, (laughs) the liquid paper that you have to trash everything. No, no, I forgot a word. No, I have to move it all together. So, and now it's just took, took, put, put and paste and that's it, you know? So everything changed a lot. And in 20, I began using Trados. And when Trados began, so imagine now it's even better and many other CAD tools that I use and the translation memories and that was a huge change and that I cannot imagine translating in a Word document from scratch because we are always have the platforms or even some companies have their own platform that you have to work on. So everything is much uh, easier and flexible, I don't know, more friendly for me, let's say. It's not like the daunting task of a blank page and you have to begin writing or translating. It's very daunting to look at a white paper, white page and say, oh, I'm going to put something in here. I don't know what, but yes. I'm going to put something in here. <laughs> you know, I'm, I don't know if I'm revealing too much here, but I'm writing a book. And it's just at the end, you know, when oh, I look at when I look at the pages, 
And I think, okay, I have to fill this. And it's not a short text. I got to put a lot of text in here. I'm not a writer by trade. That's not what I do. But it's, you know, it's, I've got a lot of thoughts I want to put on paper. But like I just you reminded me, I look at a piece of paper, a page, white page. And I'm thinking like, what do I do with this? How do I start? <laughs> but it's it, two sentences a day or a sentence a day, whatever. And then you begin and it flows because you know what you want to write. So you have it. But it's like just the beginning, you know, it's hard. Especially for you, like, I mean, you must have seen, like, let's talk a little bit about, you know, what people in our industry's favorite topic. Okay, so you know what the favorite topic is? Yeah. Beside artificial intelligence. It's called productivity, right? So productivity per translator. So when you first started, you know, have you measured or have you thought about, you know, how many words have you done at the early on and how many words comparatively you're doing now per day? Like, let's say, you know, the industry standard that everybody keeps talking about. And I don't know if it's, to be honest with you, in today's world, if this still applies, is it still legitimate? No clue. But that's what everybody uses. 2,000 words per day per translator. Yes. Is, like this, is this have been always like this? And have you experienced this? And has that evolved over time? And what is it now? Yes, I think that evolved a lot uh, because sometimes you are not even asked to do a translation. Sometimes you have to post edit like a result of machine translation. So the productivity is different and you are supposed to do it much faster because the, the product is better. You know, it's not like at the beginning that it was a disaster and you say, well, no, the machines will never replace us because this is a disaster. No, that changed a lot. And we know that. And it will continue changing, I think. I'm going to ask you about this one in a second, but I'm going to talk a little bit deeper into that because that's what everybody says. Oh, machine translation sucks. But we'll talk about that in a second. Continue on with the productivity. Yes. But at the very beginning, I was a disaster. I mean, I think, well, we all advance, you know, we all move forward. And I think we are a better version than last year, or we try to at least. But I didn't never measure my, my productivity in my early a ages you know my early beginning now yes everything has to be measured <laughs> like how many words how many hours i spend and how many are billable hours how many are like research or learning hours and it, it didn't used to be like that at least for me now i think everything is more measured or in a way structured. how was it before like when somebody gives you something to translate early on in your career how did you get paid is it per page yeah. is it per no, usually per word, because I mostly work for agencies. I have some direct local clients, but my big clients are from agencies. And they are the ones who, which usually, you know, set the the rhythm. I mean, I need this project for next week and it's done how, this volume and you have to do it with this perhaps team of people that you are going to work together and mm -hmm. usually it was 2,000 words per day or a little more, depending on the subject. Or perhaps you do it uh, faster because you are very familiar with the subject. So it's easier for you. And sometimes not because the text is too complex and you have to do more research. And, you know, it's but usually that. But for us, freelance translators, our agency is the one in charge of, <laughs> in a way, giving us the directives on how to proceed. Yeah, so they tell you, for instance, in your world, we want you to do the following and you have to either yeah. accept or don't, or don't accept. Exactly. And the budget is this and yeah. it's this, you know, so it varies, you know, from depending on the agency, on, on, on the expertise or the person. But in general, it's that way. And if you have a dear client, you are the one in charge and you say, well, you need this, for example, in my case, personal documents yeah. that you need for citizenship or they are going to study abroad and they have to legalize, certify the, the document. And so mm -hmm. we have a local association here in Buenos Aires where you go and legalize the document and they have like a orientative, let's say, because the, the industry is not regulated and you can charge whatever you want. But it's like, a, you know, a measure that you have and there you can charge more or less, but you have an idea. But you are the one if you want to charge, I don't know, $50 per page or $100 per page, you are up to you. It. The client accepts. It's yeah. a deal. Yeah. Now, like, so today's productivity for you, 
I don't know. Can you talk a little bit about that? Is it like, yes. what is it? 5,000 words a day, 10,000, yes. 1,500? What is that? No. <laughs> well, it depends. If I have to post edit, for example, the client sends uh, um, send me um, the client, I mean the agency, right? A manual that has to be post edit because it's done with a the client's own engine or the agency own agent uh, engine and you have just to post edit and proofread it and deliver it to the final step let's say mm -hmm. usually yes five six thousand thousand words a day if you mm -hmm. work full a full day of let's say six hours you must like to read i mean for somebody who it's your it's your life. I mean, all translators is the, are the same. I mean, it's your life. Mm -hmm. You read, you translate, you read again, you read a third time. I, I just you have passion for reading. Is that is that what I'm yes, hearing? Yes, very passionate reading. So don't tell me on your vacation Reader. you buy a couple of books and you go on vacation, do you? Yes. <laughs> if I am not reading, I am listening to an audio book or a podcast now. Well, thanks you know, for listening to our I'm podcast. That's good. <laughs> yes, yours the the top one. Yes, because. You're always learning and when you, I don't know, interview someone, there's always a reference to a book and and I'm listening. I, I need to need to see that book, you know, to check. And you have uh, so many books that you, I need, we need a la another life to read all the books that I mean, we Oh, want. yeah. Yeah. In depth. And so, in depth. In depth and yeah. not just superficial superficial reading mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. the reading that you take notes that you process that you read again because there is a sentence that you know mm -hmm. rings a bell and and I love reading yes yeah <laughs> and, and listening to the audiobooks that's you know that's very good I and, you, and we need more people like you like one of the things that we're talking about earlier we had another conversation about a different topic but one of the conversation we're talking about is the amount of content that's being created today and and similarly to what's happening on the translation side, on the localization side, it's happening in the content generation world, right? So in the in AI is affecting everybody's life. We think because we're in the localization business, you know, the world revolves around what we do, but it isn't. You know, the, local, the AI is impacting everything from automotive to health sciences to finance, everybody, specifically on the content generation side. And that AI involvement in content generation have quadruple if it's not like the 10x multiplier on the content creation why because it's easier now you can make content much easier and good content much easier than you've done before i know for myself like because we all do a million things at the same time and i have like hundreds and thousands of email to reply to sometimes you know i'm either typing too short too little not watching what i'm typing sometimes i make mistakes when i'm typing but gen ai helped me help me do the messages better it didn't take me out of the equation. I'm still involved. I'm still writing the, the messages, but I can write them more effectively now. I can write them without mistakes, and I, write, and I can write many of them. So that, in, that, that increase of content generation, Dolores, what end up happening, now we need to take that content and translate it. And unfortunately, we don't have enough people to do that. So we did not have enough people before AI gotten into the content generation business and now we have less in proportion to the amount of content being generated. So mm -hmm. the gap between the amount of people we have to translate, with all due respect to everybody, and the amount of people that needs to be translated, it had to be filled with some tools, some technology to assist. Yeah. Because eventually, from a uh, geopolitical perspective, from an economic perspective, whichever measurement, content cannot be constricted to one group of demographics. It's content. You know, it has to find its way to other demographics. Nobody can say, well, I published a book in Argentina. And as somebody who is in New York who doesn't read Spanish says, well, I don't know. Well, you should know. Now with Gen AI, you should be able to read the book. Yes. So right. the, the question is around is the, the amount of content and the gap between what can we do using, you know, translators such as yourself versus machine translation and that post-editing, that bridging of the gap. And that's why that whole discussion around how is AI impacting our business, right? So any comments yeah. on what I just said? Yes, I think it's so true because some people, 
some clients, in fact, said, uh, now what are you going to do? Because you are a translator. Are you looking for another job? Because you will have no more job. You know, everything is done by AI and and no need to, to, to your work, you know, your profession is out of the out of out of the world and I, and no, and I don't think so I think that as you said post edit is very good the post edit production from ai from the machine but we need that human touch if we really need to have that content generated as you said to be fully absorbed by the other language that is reading you know perhaps if you go to russia and ai and all that content will be good just to read it from the machine because you don't need to be that. But if it's a, perhaps a brochure for your new campaign, a manual that you need a, a, a client or your own employees to read, and you can do it by a machine, but you need the human to check that everything is perfect because sometimes it's only a word, but that word made the whole difference in the in the paragraph or, or the, the subject that you are writing, you know? So it's your image, your your own brand that is in at stake so i think we will be uh, needed <laughs> the human translator yeah. and it's so but- so as many people are saying dolores right now they're saying we are in an era of trust basically in regards to machine translation that is right so we are saying things like do i trust how far can i trust how much can i trust and what do i trust to what degree to what type of content I can, you know, disperse my trust. So in your opinion, and there are many translation machine translation engines out there, have you tried them? Which one is your favorite and why? Yes. Uh, yes, we have to trust. For us humans, trust is difficult. I love the word. And I think we have to apply it more in our personal and professional lives, but it's not easy. Because we have to trust and with trust comes like a, that you have to release, that you cannot control everything because we tend to, I know, I know everything is under control and it's never under control. You know that, but we have the idea that we control everything, <laughs> but you have to trust the process and, and how everything will flow. And with trust, I think comes hand with the um, respect that you have and the, um, yes, it's respect for the person who is asking for that job, for example, that like the agency, and that you trust that everything that you are doing and producing and improving from that own machine that will be better with your own human production will be for the good uh, purpose and the good um, final purpose of the document that it has to travel and it has to go. So I think we have to trust on that. And I usually use, uh, well, the, the, the engines that the, the um, agencies uh, send me and also um, Deeple, the pet version, and not, not more like I'm not very, I use uh, AI, but very basically, you know, very basic. No, I'm not very, exp- I'm not an expert on that. No, I'm just interested in your perspective on, you know, which machine translation from a translator perspective you would trust more. If you think, you know, like think think about it, like somebody sends you something to translate and they tell you, oh, this is coming from whatever machine translation. I don't want to name anybody here. And you think, oh, this is going to take me a long, lot of time to fix. So I yeah. want to make sure I, I allocate enough time for it. Or this, t- oh, this is coming from this engine. That's going to be easy. It's going to be done very quickly. Yeah. Do you have, have you, have you come through that? Have you come across this? Yes, I cannot mention any names. No, just no, no, that's fine. That's a okay. no name. But yes, no name. there are some platforms from different agencies that are more trusted, let's say, or you you know that, well, you I will have to work, but it's basically, it will be basically very good. Like the, you know, the foundation is very good. And sometimes, well, no, I have to devote more time. But yes, it happens, I think, to all of us. Because, because one of the things that everybody's talking about, and I think they're missing the boat on, is, you know, you cannot, and, and I've been saying this like for, I don't know, a few years now, you cannot just log into any machine translation engine and you put something in it and you ask it to translate and then you say, well, I don't like the quality. Well, of course, you're not going to like the quality. 100% you're not going to like the quality. Why? Because you didn't train that engine. 
that engine is just spitting out what the internet taught it to produce. Exactly. That's it. And so you want to use the free version and you want to judge everything by the free version? Well, then go download an app you know, that teaches you how to order a beer in whatever country <laughs> you're traveling to. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it is a data, data, data. We need data to train engines. Engine needs to be trained on a specific data to produce better outcome. And if we don't train those engines, it's garbage in, garbage out. Like it's not going to do much to do anything better. To improve the to improve the uh, the outcome of the content, and so as everybody starting to look at their budget, starting to cut the prices, starting to look at how much I can do with the little money I have in terms of projects or in terms of they're, they're getting paid by the customer, they still need to allocate some money to train that engine. You cannot just take it from the customer, put it in an engine, you know, and and uh, send it to a quick post editing and send it back to the customer because even with quick post editing. Because I'm assuming the agency is saying, please spend X amount of time on it. And they're not, you know, saying to spend two months on this, on, 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 a, on a job. Exactly. So even with that, that, that little budget they give you to work on a project, how much can you do with that? You're going to do with whatever you can, but I'm 100% certain you're not going to be able to do 100% of catching every little tiny mistake. So you're going to be okay. spending on it as much what the agency tells you to spend on it. Exactly. In fact... There are uh, ISO standards on post machine editing. No, that's post, right. Uh, human post edit of machine translation. So imagine there's an ISO standard on this. So there are processes that have to be followed in order to really improve that. Because as you said, the content will be translated. The, the, it will be understood, but it will not sound natural. There will be no emotion on that. There will be nothing, just words, but words need to be, you know, amalgamated and really to have an impact because if not, mm -hmm. we will not be reading a book. We will not be mm -hmm. captivated by a, by a book, by, a, mm -hmm. by any document. So that's it. I totally agree. Yeah. And, and my understanding, we brought up the ISO, you're an ISO auditor as well. How did you get into that? Yes. Well, in the pandemic, but ISO 27001, that is the safety ISO on security because of all this, you know, that all our Cyber security? documents are digital, exactly. And you manage very confidential information. And that's very important for the client, how it you will safeguard everything. So I did, yes, the course in Bureau Veritas, that it's a national, international company, and I am an auditor. But just to know more in detail the, the, the standard and how to apply it in my own processes for the security and, as you said, trust and confidentiality of my clients. So when you do ISO auditing, who are you doing this for? Your enterprise customer, your agencies? Who do you provide the service yes. to? Usually, usually my own direct clients that ask for that, you know, how we are going to, to deal with this, perhaps uh, documents in paper that are not digital sometimes, or balance sheets or uh, very important information. So I like uh, have a checklist on all the processes, how we're going to deal, who, are, who is in charge of every part, like a, like a production to have the client safe and trusted that everything will be followed according to the standard. You know, in, 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 in a nutshell, it's what we do every day, but we are not writing about it. You are not describing the process that perhaps you do, but not consciously, you know? Yeah. yeah. We do it yeah. automatically yeah. because we are so used to that. But when you take into account and you are accountable for all the things that you are doing, you pay more, more attention and you will have a better final product in general. Absolutely. And so from your perspective, how do you view that whole conversation about AI? Are you Which side are you on? Good, bad, mm. or ugly? <laughs> I'm always with a good one. <laughs> I have to be positive. No, but to tell you the truth, as we were talking at the beginning, I am, I am positive. I think... In my case, I experienced so many changes in our profession from the very beginning till today. So imagine when I began and now, and I think there's always a good, there's a good future for us translators because language is what communicates us. Culture is 
the lifeblood of everyone living on earth. So I think we will need the, the aid of expert or professional linguists, translators, interpreters, localizers, copywriters all over the world to really transmit that message, not with the aid of the computer, the machines, the AI mm -hmm. technology, and all that's yet to come <laughs> in our lives but with like it and more tools more tools to our toolkit to offer a better service to be more productive perhaps less less is more you know <laughs> you will spend less time but perhaps you have more or add of other things but i think it's a bright future for us if we are willing to learn and you know, take that train and not be waiting for, no, this will disappear. Absolutely correct. You hit the nail on the head is the learning part, right? So, you know, you've, you've seen it, I've seen it, and any generation, you know, will talk about the same thing, that technology changes. Things change in our lives. I mean, you've seen it from doing research in a, in a library to, you know, pressing a button on the internet and finding all the information you need. And similarly with AI, the common wisdom is that everybody is talking about, it is not a threat to the jobs of the translator or the interpreters. However, the interpreter and the trans translators need to learn AI to continue doing their job, to continue being a differentiator, to continue adopting these tools or adapting to these tools in their jobs. If you do not learn these tools, it's like not learning how to use Microsoft Word. Anybody okay. in the job today who do not use know how to use Microsoft Word Either they're on their way out of the business, that means they're retiring, or they're not getting enough jobs to get, sustain them because everything in the world runs now. You receive Word documents all the time or PDF documents, whatever. But the idea is that like any technology, you either learn it or you're not going to find jobs in it. So exactly. if we don't learn it, we don't embrace it, we don't take the time to figure it out. How do I employ this on my in my job? Because one of the podcasts that I'm publishing today, I just finished editing mm -hmm. just before this call, wow. is about using AI in sales tools. So how do we use AIs in sales tools? And I, my speaker and, and I, the interviewer, Bethany and, and I, we go through screen sharing. So we share the screen. We mm -hmm. show how people are could be using AI in sales. How can these types of conversations learn from and diagnose each conversation using AI? And what to focus on in a conversation. You know, how do I, for instance, if I want to, before I get into a conversation, I need to know a little bit about the person. AI can send me an email, say, this person is detail oriented. This person likes straightforward answers. This guy likes short answer, not long answers. You, you got to adopt your, adapt to your audience. So again, exactly. it is either I learn it or we learn it collectively. Like I've seen some people send me messages like on, uh, LinkedIn, I think it was, or you, or Twitter, X now, you know, telling me that they lost their jobs because of AI. Mm, I beg to differ. You did not lose it because you because of AI. You lost it because you didn't want to learn AI. <laughs> I'm sorry, exactly. but you gotta be, you gotta be, we gotta be brutally honest on this one. Yes, you are right. I, I'm, I'm now. I was. I recalled last year in November, I think. Or no, no, not in November. In January last. Well, this January, January 2023 that my eldest son said, mom, come here. This is a tool that will help you a lot with the research because I spent a lot of time doing research, chat GPT. Just write, for example, the name of the company that I'm doing a translation and marketing, whatever. And then chat GPT gives you every all the information and then you have to check if that's true. But it really helps a lot on productivity side. And it's a tool because it helps me to move faster, as you said, but it will not replace me. But there are translators no. that said, no, I will never use that. No, that's like, no. No, so, I mean, it's, I like, it's becoming like, it's more like, uh, I don't know what it is, but I feel like there are some association or there are some jurisdictions around the world where they're completely against machine transition yeah. and AI. And I, I'm not going to name any names, but there was a conference not too long ago where that has been mentioned. And, you know, no, we're not going to push AI. And I think that was the comment. And everybody in the audience jumped up and started clapping. I think this is collectively head in the sand kind of, a, kind of an event. Okay, you don't have to, but some other people will. And you'll be left behind. I'm sorry to tell you that. <laughs> yes, we have to, as you said, face the challenge because we cannot hide. 
it's already yeah. here it's among us we have to embrace right. it but positively and with all our knowledge and eager with our eagerness to keep on learning because as you said i have to read more books on this listen to more experts talking about this all your conversations help a lot everything that's right so Toward the end of our conversation, and I don't want to keep you on the phone too long. No. I really appreciate you joining me today. It's a pleasure. So lovely of you to take to take some time Thank to be with you. me. I really appreciate it. Um, appreciate any last comments or thoughts you like to share? Well, I think translation and well, linguistic, the profession is marvelous. I was always very grateful for having the opportunity of earning my living, doing what I love the most. And I keep on learning and, you know, new things, new everything, every single day of my life. And I love it because I think we have to be like that, like open-minded. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. despite all the challenges that we have always facing, but it's life, you know, mm -hmm. I think it's good to keep on this track and I will do it. <laughs> I will not retire, as I say to my family. Don't. When are you going to retire? Never. <laughs> we need more people like you. Don't retire. We will not because we do it because we need it, of course, but we love it because you we love what you do. Yes, I think it's that's, we do that's a difference. service that's a to difference. the community, a service, but with with love and with passion, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. Good. And, you know, that's the differentiator between a job and a career, something that you love to do without any getting paid for it. I, I guess that's the test. Would you do what you do if somebody did not pay you for it? And if the answer is yes, that means you're doing the job that you love to do. Having yeah. to get paid for it, of course, it affords a life. And affords a lot of other things. So that's perfect. Yeah. That's a perfect marriage. So thank, thanks you. For, thank you. I want to thank you, Dolores, uh, for joining me. I really appreciate it uh, today. Thank you for your time. Uh, much appreciated. And for our audience, uh, if you want to get to know a little bit about Dolores or you want to connect with Dolores, Dolores Rojo Kinatsu. And Dolores is on LinkedIn. Look her up and chat with Dolores. She, she's very welcoming. I know I've known uh, Dolores like for the past, uh, what is it, a couple of years now? We've chatted on LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I, and I, you know, we became friends and off you go. Here we are doing a podcast mm -hmm. together. I really appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, thanks to you for this opportunity. I'm honored. And I really love everything that you shared on social media. And now this channel that you were, congrats you again and continue doing it because it's very important for all of us all over the world that we listen to you. I mean, not only in Canada, in US, in Europe, everywhere in Latin America. And I think it's so important to, to broaden, you know, the atmosphere because you have so many different people that interview many perspectives and it's huge. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and, and it's good for me to get to know different angle on the same topic. And that's why not necessarily just talk to CEOs of companies or, you know, owners of companies or, you know, technologies, etc. It's very important to talk to individuals such as yourself, translators, project managers, desktop publishers. They're all invited to speak on the channel because they all constitute a pieces of the puzzle of what make localization, localization industry, to be honest with you. You know, an owner of the company does not exist on their own. They need people to help them do the job. A CEO yeah. of a company will not be able to do a CEO's job unless they have people to help them do their job or become a company to begin with. Yeah. So, no, you bring up a very Thanks. good point. Mm -hmm. I, I love I love that broad horizon conversation that this platform is allowing me to do. And you're welcome to this channel anytime. I'd love to have you back. You, and Robin. maybe we'll talk about thank a different you. topic. But thank you so much. Yes. Appreciate it. Thanks. And you are... For sure, definitely a creator. Uh, I read that you have all the Christmas lights for, for, oh, for yeah. Christmas Did you see that? now. <laughs> yes, but you keep on improving. This is amazing. That's why you are now a leader, a creator. You took it, take into account everyone. The, the, I don't know. Did you see the, uh, I'm just, I'm still recording here where this is fine. These, did you see the uh, Colombian dance party that they came in in front of the house and they did a, a Christmas dance party right in front of the house. They asked my, my wife for permission if they can do that. Wow. And we said yes. And it's it's a hit on Instagram again. When I go to Toronto, I have to go like pre-Christmas, let's say. Or how long will oh, you... I would love to show you around. I would love to show you the yes. house. It's absolutely great. But my wife and I would long, love to have you. 
Thanks a lot. How long do you like uh, stay with all the lights after Christmas? So like, on the 15th January? of December. Uh, sorry, 15th of January. January. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. So beautiful. Congratulations. And the creation, you know, you are very creative. <laughs> Robin, no, I, I re this part I really like because we do it ourselves. Like my wife and I do it ourselves. We create mm -hmm. a lot of the ornaments ourselves. We make them in the in the house. Some of them we buy, obviously not all, but some of them we make ourselves. So it's wow. it's 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 my it's my joy. I really enjoy doing that. But and thank you again. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. <I know. laughs> thank you again for being part of this. I really appreciate it for our audience. Thank you again for listening in. I really appreciate you tuning in and 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 bringing us to your world. I really appreciate that from you. If you don't mind, if you're listening to this conversation, you like this conversation, please press, press the like button. And if you don't mind sharing the content with others, it would help us quite a bit. Uh, thanks again for tuning in. And until next time, this is Robin Ayub and Dolores Rojo Kinatsu signing off. Thank you so much, Dolores. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Thanks for tuning in to the Localization Fireside Chat. Take the warmth of knowledge and renewed cultural passion with you. Keep exploring. Stay curious. And until next time, this is Robin Ayu. Keep those global conversations alive.